All right, here we are live with episode number 66 of the Trauma Informed Podcast. And I'm excited uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, to talk to another expert in this field, and also that I'm just coming off of uh, two days with uh, two over 200 fellow unapologetic disruptors um, <laughs> from the Trauma Informed Educators Network Conference. So I, I'm I'm kind of, it's like when you left summer camp, if you went to summer camp when you were in school, you left on that real excitement. Um, that's where I am. So I know this is going to be an energetic conversation because I'm, I'm fired up uh, generally, but I feel really fired up. So today's guest, welcome, uh, Dr. Barrick Feldman. I'm so glad you are here. How are you? Tell us your story and, and just tell us a little bit about you. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm also psyched. This is my last week in school. Uh, we're, tomorrow's our last day. We have like only an hour, but it's always really exciting. I feel like the last week of school. Um, I'm a psychologist. I am a clinical psychologist. I'm also a school psychologist. I've been working in schools um, since 1998 for a really long time. I have a practice. I work with kids who have anxiety. I work with kids who have ADHD and other um, like social issues that they're going through. And um, I'm also um, an author and I, I wrote The Grit Guide for Teens in 2017, pre-COVID. And I just released with my uh, co-author, Rebecca Camizio, The Resilience Workbook for Kids. So um, I'm excited about talking about all those things with you. Awesome. Well, welcome. And uh, let's dig in because I think you just said something that that I, that is like music to my ears. And that is, this is your last week of school, which means you are in schools. And I think that is a perspective that we I, I always enjoy having on this show. So let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about it. And I've talked about it from my perspective as a principal, because uh, I was a principal until March of this last year for the last seven years. But let's hear about your perspective. How do you feel this last, I don't even, post-COVID, I don't even know what you want to call it now, because I know I still have friends that are telling me um, that they're testing positive and such. But mm -hmm. in the midst of wherever we are, what has your experience been like at school? What have you seen that's changed? What have you seen that's uh, different? What do you see that's the same? Just what's your experience been? Yeah. I, I mean, I think that this year has been very challenging. Um, I think there's been some really, really good things. I think that I've been like a big proponent of social emotional learning before it was like trendy. This is like a number of years. And now it, everybody's like talking about things like social emotional learning. So I think that that has been a real positive uh, about this year. But I do think that it's been a really challenging year for both the kids and for staff. I'm seeing staff being more burnt out than uh, I've ever seen before. And I'm seeing kids who really don't have the same skills as what I would expect um, third graders or fifth graders or even kindergartners to have. And that teachers are really feeling a need to help build those skills in the classroom, at recess. Um, and um, it, there's just this huge need. Yeah. And I think, that, yeah, that you, there's a lot to unpack there, that what you said. And I think um, these things have existed, but, but maybe not in the intensity and space that they are currently in. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, there's been conversations and I, I love that you talk about you've been on the SEL, uh, you know, you've been on the bandwagon for a long time. Yeah. I, I didn't even realize I was on it when I first started <laughs> teaching in, in early 2000s. Um, it was just how I taught because when I was in school, um, it wasn't like that. As a matter of fact, it was, um, uh, it, it was more sit down, be quiet, do what you're told and you are to be seen and not heard kind of, uh, so I didn't want any kid that I taught to experience that, but, but here's what I, here's what I think is also interesting. Dr. Barrick is that there are right now legislation that's trying to ban and, and, and eliminate the, the idea of social and emotional learning. Matter of fact, there's a documentary in the county that I live in mm -hmm. that is speaking against it, saying it's indoctrinating our kids, right? So there's so much happening because now people are talking about it, but now people are afraid of it, where it's like, wait a minute, we're, we're just talking about the social emotional health of our kids. And right. so let, let's talk about what, you, what you've developed because mm -hmm. um, I am in the midst of writing a book and my book is about social emotional learning right. and trauma-informed education and I sit back and go, man, like I'm in the midst of writing this. And there's people that are like, what are you? No, this right. is not okay. So I, tell yeah. us about your work. 
And, and before I even talk about my work, but I think that that also speaks to just the polarization that we're just seeing in our country. And I think that polarization is also being felt by our children and is feeling um, unsettling for them as well. So um, I think that that's another part of, of that conversation. But what happened was I was very influenced um, by positive psychology. Um, I'm not sure how familiar your, your listeners are by that movement. For a long time, psychologists knew why um, kids maybe or adults were, were, were sort of un upset or miserable, but we didn't know how people could thrive. And um, Marty Seligman, who's considered one of the fathers of positive psychologists, you know, often talked about um, education and he would often ask this question about, um, you know, if you ask people, parents, teachers, you know, what do you want for kids? You know, they'll say that we want kids to be happy. We want them to be good citizens. We want them to be productive at work. And then you say, well, what are we teaching them in school? And we're teaching them reading. We're teaching them math. There was such a disconnect. And so that's what led me. I know you said how you um, became interested in this field, but I became interested because I was really thinking, what do we really want for our children? What is going to be the important uh, strengths, character strengths, um, quality skills that we want? And how, if we're thinking about school, shouldn't school be the place where we are learning those skills? And so um, early on, I became really interested in, you know, character strengths and um, teaching more of what we call social emotional le learning before it was, as I said, you know, sort of trendy um, and kind of focusing on the topics of um, the first thing that we actually started was a wellness club in my school, and it was called um, KFG. And our, our motto was um, nobody does uh, K uh, nobody does uh, kindness, flexibility, and grit better than Harrison Avenue. Sort of a take on you know Kentucky Fried Chicken. And um, so we focused on kindness, we focused on flexibility, we focused on grit. And um, we did, I did it together with the PE teacher. And together, we tried to have activities that sort of fostered those things. I also worked in classrooms and worked with classroom teachers, first on an individual level. Like, let's say there was a class that was sort of struggling. The teacher would invite me in. And then other teachers were like, oh, we kind of like what's going on in that classroom. And then more and more, it became um, the culture of the school. And then... This year, um, I was we were really excited that I worked a lot with the instructional specialists in my school about belonging. Because for me, a lot I feel, and I know you feel this way, it's all about people. It's about relationships. It's about support. And I felt like it was very important for both our staff and for our kids to feel a sense of belonging. We also started in COVID um, a program called Staff Supporting Staff, where monthly we would meet as a staff and just talk and connect. Um, and then part of our whole day of belonging, um, we started off with a kickoff. And then actually yesterday, we just had a really wonderful day where we just did belonging. We, we had a read aloud about belonging. We had a, um, a music and dancing uh, activity about belonging and then a PE activity. And one of the ways that I found very powerful to get all these messages across is having older students teach younger students these things. So, you know, it may be really hard to get fifth graders to dance, but when I say to fifth graders, go and get your buddies, go help them to dance, get them on the conga line, they're much more willing to do that. How, go and help your buddies write a letter about what it means to have a belonging school. I find that that way it's much more um, uh, accessible to have that message come across. Yeah, and it's interesting because I was uh, I was in a virtual conference today, um, and there was there were some researchers they were talking about the Arctic scale, and it's the scale to um, evaluate your school, your system on how well you're doing the work that is trauma informed education, right? And one of those pieces is what you said. It's actually asking kids if they feel that they belong, and if there's a loving and caring adult in the building um, that they can connect to. And I was listening and I went back to my very first year of starting this work in the school that I led. That was one of the very first things we did is we actually asked the children from kindergarten mm -hmm. to fourth grade, uh, do you know somebody in this building, an adult that cares and loves for you? Uh, and it was 98%. It was like, wow, you know, right? because that's what it, you're 100%. That is what it is about. It is about strong, stable, nurturing, predictable relationships, um, whether that's kid to kid, whether that's adult to kid, and whether that's kid to adult, 
it mm-hmm. all goes or adult to adult. I almost forgot that mm-hmm. one. Um, it goes all of those ways, right? The microcosm that is school. There's so many factors that drive this work. So I, I want to get into um, the, the word that you've mentioned a few times and it's in your book because there's a lot of controversy around this word um, mm-hmm. in the trauma informed world because the neuroscience is really strong about how the body and the brain are impacted by stress and trauma. And, and this, and, and the idea that has been in the past of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps mm-hmm. has been a misnomer. And unfortunately, and I want to really dig into your thoughts, this idea of grit and pull yourself up by your bootstraps have been uh, synonymous with each other. They kind of gone together. So talk about why, t- just tell me about why that word, why, why did, and you did this in 2017. So it's, yes. it's been a few years ago, but tell me where it came from. How did you come right. about with that one? Yes. Um, and what are your thoughts now? So in terms of the word grit, um, I mean, the book that I wrote was for teenagers and um, the ideas about it was how do you take like, actually, I was based on Dr. Angela Duckworth. I mean, she's probably the foremost expert on grit and her definition of grit. And I want to start there because I think that's part of where things get derailed is that it's passion. And I'm going to say that again, passion and perseverance for long term goals. So to be gritty, it means to have connection to something that's really important and sticking with things that are important for you over time. And again, I think that what has happened in you know the media is that the people have thought a lot about maybe the sticking to things or putting up, you know, pulling yourself up with the bootstraps, but have left off that whole topic about connection to connecting to the things that you're important. And I do think it is important with both young kids and with teenagers to help them find things that they connect to and be able to think more long term. You know, a lot of times in my work, I see that sometimes something is valuable in the moment, but in the long run, it doesn't serve you well. Just before I um, had, I just just was working with a patient and he struggles to sleep in his own bed. In the moment, it feels better to him to go to his parents' bed. But in the long run, if he really wants to be able to be more, to, to face this fear and to be able to sleep, it's not helping him every time he sleeps in his bed. So there's always that challenge, a lot with anxiety, with a lot of things that we do. And I do think it's really important in this world that we're living to help youth to be able to tap into that and to really think about what's going to be good in the long term and how do I set myself up for success. And again, I know that there has that been that connection that has never been my contention. I would never say someone said is my um, feeling that I'm asking people who are downtrodden to be pull them up up for their bootstraps. Absolutely not. But I do think that it is valuable to help people who are struggling to have them understand the science and the research about mindset and behavior that can support more gritty behavior because ultimately they will benefit from them. And the other thing I'll just say is that the other thing that I'm very strong about is that I think that obviously I wrote a book for teens and for kids, but I think it's very important to say that it's not only an individual problem. There's structural things that are going on. There are cultural things. There are environmental things. And those cannot be ignored. And it's not my contention that it's all about the individual. So that's another thing that I feel very strongly about. Yeah. And, and I, I wonder too, where does, the, where does the neuroscience fit into this when it comes to trauma, right? Because it impacts so much, it impacts the nervous system, the polyvagal theory, the polyvagal nerve, and the, the, the having the parasympathetic and the non-parasympathetic things, right? It, all of this plays a role. And so I think another piece that we have to get to kids is what happens when you've experienced or are experiencing these awful things to your physical and neurological self, right? Because there's a lot going on. It's why when we get worked up, our heart beats really fast and our di- pupils dilate and the blood rushes to our appendages, right? There's these responses that naturally occur when our system is in a state of stress or have has or have experienced trauma. And so I agree with that 100% coupled with that second piece of how does trauma stress impact? And then we go into, I, I think it's even, and you're right, it's not just individual, right? This is collective too. So how does collective experience impact 
all of us, right? Whether that's COVID, whether that's systemic racism, whatever it is, mm -hmm. how does that impact us? Not just as individuals, but it does. But how does it collectively influence large populations of people? And, and I think we've dug into that deeply in this podcast. Right. And I do agree. And one thing we have to start talking about, which is what you're talking about, is hope, right? Mm -hmm. Is being able to see and, and have that idea that it can get better and people around me care about me and that's how it's going to get better. And all of those pieces, we don't talk about that enough. We want to talk about what's happened and how bad mm -hmm. it is, but we, we, we miss out on that opportunity of long-term planning, right? Those are life skills. Matter of fact, I just heard a study, um, I think it was in the last six months, I don't know when the study was done, but they surveyed kids and I think they were be ages of eight to 14. And basically they determined that kids make decisions with the idea of less than 24 hours into the future. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm gonna make this decision and I'm not even thinking, maybe it was 48, whatever it is, it was still not like, Nope, didn't even think about the long term. So there's so much there that that is needed in supporting our kids. Agree? Right. Yes, absolutely. I always say to parents, the future for kids is off at a cliff. It doesn't exist. It's like off their um, radar. And to kind of going back to um, what you said, I think one of the, um, the the praises I've gotten for the resilience work for kids, and I also do in the Grit Guide for Teens, is that I start with emotions. And um, people have said to me, they really like that section, understanding your emotions, understanding what we call comfortable emotions and maybe uncomfortable emotions, learning how to name them, learning how to tame them, understanding about your amygdala, understanding about amygdala hijack. And um, I think, again, in my work, I think one of the things that have been so um, pivotal to helping teachers during this whole time was helping them understand that first we need to regulate, help relate, and then regulate kids before we can intervene. I think, you know, obviously when a kid is very dysregulated, it, it makes the adult feel dysregulated. And then often they just kind of want to shut it down. But understanding just how to sit with kids and just feel. I remember a few weeks ago, I don't know if this happens in other people's school, but when there's an issue that happens in school, I'll be called, I'll, you know, I'll get my name on the PA or my phone. And there was a child having a hard time at recess. And um, I have a relationship with this child. And he was like, kind of like going from tree to tree to tree to tree. And I had to kind of slowly, you know, kind of come up and I had to basically go on the ground. And I was like, kind of like crawling on the ground and like just sitting. And then after time, when we were sort of like, he saw that I was there and I was there, then we could sort of like move to like, do you want to come to my office and not even talk about the thing? Because, you know, that's what people think. Just talk to him about the thing. Get it out. Figure out what's going on. Slowly, slowly come to my office. And then, you know, again, people I'm sure could peek in my office and they're like, why are you coloring? Why are you playing that game? But those things are super, super necessary because in order for kids to really get their their thoughts back and their brain back they need to be regulated and in a place to be able to do that absolutely and and the the i guess the creator of regulate really reason, reason was on here dr bruce perry twice yeah. right and, and it's powerful and you're exactly right we got a kid we've got to get kids to re we got to get anybody humans yeah. to regulate by relating to them, by relationship, by connecting, right? And that could be nonverbal. That I've been I've been in the hallway many a times with kids and that's simply saying, I'm just gonna sit right here. Yeah. Whenever you're ready, you just give me thumbs up and you and I can take a walk and talk. We can go back outside, we can go to Mount, wherever mm -hmm. you want. Um, and then you get to the reasoning part, right? And, and I think you're right. Adults a lot of times don't don't get that. And my my pushback always is so when you're upset, do you want me just to continue <laughs> telling you what you're doing wrong or right. why you didn't turn that report in or nobody wants that. Right. right. And, and we dehumanize kids a lot of times and think that they're just supposed to take it. But so let's get into your book because I want to know more. So, so what, what drove you to write it? What is the, what's the context of it? Like, just tell us more. Right. So I guess we'll like start historically. So I wrote, as I said, um, the Grit Guide for Teens in 2017. And it was, again, about this about this idea of helping teens have passion and perseverance. I'm a very gritty person, um, as that's just my personality. I've always been that kind of person. 
Uh, I did in 2017, I did the New York City Marathon. Um, and I started to also do a lot more kind of like activities like that. It was sort of interesting to me. Uh, and that was sort of the history there. And then came COVID. And what actually happened, and I write about it in the Resilience Workbook for Kids, is I actually, and I was at the peak of my career, and so many good things were happening for me. I all of a sudden got sick. And I didn't really know what was wrong with me. Um, I was going from doctor to doctor, and it was really unclear. And what ultimately happened was, is that I had a growth on my pituitary, which was making basically cortisol, stress hormone. So I literally was like having this experiment done on me that I was feeling all the stress. And I was really struggling and trying to figure out what was going on. And ultimately I had surgery and it just took a long time and it took a long time to heal and from everything. And even till this day, I still get headaches from the whole experience. It's still, I had health, I have, my health is so much better and stable, but I still, you know, are, isn't exactly the same. And so that really turned me into thinking about the topic about resilience. What do you do in stressful situations? How do you help people? What did I learn from that experience? How can I help kids um, learn from the things that I learned that were helpful for me? And what does the science teach us? And that's why it came from a really personal place that I decided to write this book. So when you were going through that and your cortisol levels were skyrocketed, did you feel gritty? <laughs> no, no, really? no, no. And actually, yeah. I did not only feel gritty, I also didn't feel like I wanted to connect with people. Wow. And, and I think that that's important. And I know that from my work as a clinician, that when kids are anxious or kids are depressed, it's like a mm -hmm. suck. Mm. You don't want to feel, you don't want to do things. I often tell people you have to act opposite. Like everything in you wants to just like go under the covers or, 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 or not to exercise. And, but to tell you the truth, the best thing for me to do was exercise. The best thing for me was to connect. The best thing for me was to do mindfulness. Did I want to do it? Did, is that where my head was? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. However, those are the things that I sort of needed to do. Yeah. And I think it's powerful because we, when you're a kid, like you, that intuition may not be as strong as an adult of knowing, like, I've got to do these things. I don't know how many kids that would come into the school with their hoodies tied and all you could see was their eyes. Right. And I'd be like, Hey, come on over. Let's figure out what's going on. Like, tell me what's up. Well, something happened the night before or their siblings got in a fight in the car and one of them hit them. And right. there's just so many things and so many pieces. And I think, you having that experience is so powerful because you can connect to that overload of cortisol, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, sure, it was a phys physiological uh, piece, not necessarily a trauma and stress, but the cortisol is cortisol is cortisol, yeah. right? Like it, 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 that's how it impacts us all. Uh, such powerful connection and story there that I I hope that you do, or if you don't, you will share that with the, with kids. Be mm -hmm. like, listen. I had this and this chemicals in my body and it made me feel really stressed because I don't think kids, they get it if you explain it. Right? right. And what we learned in my, in my, in my work with, with the school that we taught our kids um, and we taught them how to use breathing as a primary catalyst to calm your nervous system and calm that cortisol level and calm right. your heart rate. It's such powerful skills. So, so let's talk about the importance of connection because you see that as such a primary driver in this work. Um, how do you see the role of connection and what do you see it in, in the work of resilience and, and grit? Right. So again, the research is very clear. The number one factor in building resilience. And again, just to define resilience, we're throwing out, I did define passion based on Angela Duckworth's um, work. Uh, resilience, a lot of people speak to it. Um, I'm very proud. Bob Rooks is one of the foremost experts on resilience. He actually wrote the forward for my book and he's, I feel like almost like a mentor to me. Um, and he, and, they, and basically it's the idea about being able to cope from stress um, to be able, I don't love the word bounce back. It's, it seems very like simplistic and, and not really where my, you know, like I don't really think very trauma informed, but it's the ability that when you have stress that you can somehow cope with that effectively. And ultimately, and sometimes, um, be able, not that you would want this in your life, but somehow possibly grow from that. Um, and in terms of, you know, kind of the work that I talk about in the book, I, I do feel like resilience is by connection, 
by having that charismatic adult. That's again, a term that uh, Julius Siegel sort of coined. And also Robert Brooks speaks a lot more um, ab about, but that is the number one factor is having people in your life. Absolutely. And I think that's somebody just put uh, hashtag bounce forward. They like the idea of bouncing forward. I think that's that post-traumatic growth, right? It yeah. is a thing and it does exist. If the buffers are in place, you know, and, and you and I were talking earlier about uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Beth Bethel and mm -hmm. Dr. Oh my goodness. Uh, my brain, Bob uh, Sege, um, their work about hope. Right. And, and, and their, their, their research around the impact of positive childhood experiences, right. which three of those could happen in a school that they yeah. surveyed, they found very clearly that just because something has happened to you doesn't mean that you're going to have negative health outcomes or negative right. impact. Because the buffering fact was, did you have these positive relation-based safety nets in place? And it also means that if you haven't had a lot of adversity, but you don't have the positive relationship experiences, it could actually be more detrimental. And so exactly right that relationships are the key to all of these pieces. And I think in schools, we have such a amazing opportunity that is given to very few people other than parents in any sector, in any field that we have to take seriously. And, and I think from your being a psychologist, you, you have a different perspective when you walk into schools, right? Than a teacher that doesn't have your background and experience and hasn't written. And so what do you see as some, some next steps, driving factors that you say, if we could just do these few things, it could have a, a great impact as a profession in education. Right. So I feel like, first of all, I feel telling teachers that they can have this impact is so empowering and letting them know, and it doesn't have to be so deep. It can be small things, even gestures and, and, and greetings. I have this one teacher in my school. Every day I see her, she has a different kind of handshake she has with the students when they walk in. Small things make such a difference and that teachers really have, to me, it's like a privilege that we are able to make such a difference in, in children's lives. Um, and I think understanding, again, that when kids are dysregulated, what we first really need to do is help them first through that relationship, then help them to regulate and then help them to, to kind of get back like where, where you need to. So I think um, having that trauma-informed lens and telling teachers and explaining that in a very simple way and sharing Bruce Perry's work, I think is really, really important for educators. Well, and you said something also that you do every month is you allow connection to happen with the staff. Right. And to me, that is as important, if not more important, because um, I see this and it, it's uncomfortable to say, but it's true. Schools can be a traumatic place for many, many kids, right? Kids can experience trauma in school and have never experienced trauma outside of school. And a lot of that comes from the constant push for more, 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 more from the adults, right? Dysregulated adults uh, have such a major impact. And what you said about what your school does every month, giving them that opportunity to connect is so powerful. And, and I believe that this work is more about us, more about the adults than it right. is about the kids. It's about us retraining ourselves on going, how do we handle these situations as opposed to what do the kids need to do differently? Right. It's about us. And part of that is connecting and making sure we're doing our own work so that we understand when we're activated or triggered or when we feel these emotions coming in and not knowing why and understanding our past traumas and knowing those can come back uh, through our experiences current. But that is such a powerful piece. Will you talk a little bit more about what that looks like when teachers come together? Because I think a lot of our listeners will connect to that. I'll talk about that, but I do want to kind of say something back about something that I did with the book. So when we first created the book, Rebecca Kamizzi and I and myself, we felt so it was so important that the parent, the grown up, the the person who was going to do this book, 
that they would have some information in there. So when we first actually designed the book, there was the piece about the, the, the parent in there. Obviously, then the book became too big. And anybody who knows who writes a book, there's a word count, things have to be eliminated. So um, we wound up having this section for the parent, the person or caregiver um, to um, have it online. And one of the things that we say very strongly is that we want that first this work starts with that caregiver. It has to start there. And in that section, which is online and very easy to access, is there's an online section for the caregiver. There's an online section for the educator. Um, before doing this work and 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 should you know suggesting this book for the kids or have the kids do it, you need to do work for yourself and on yourself to build your own resilience and also know how to build resilience in youth. But also you need to do it on yourself. So that was a very key point in in our vision in terms of of doing this work. In terms uh, of oh sorry okay. oh no no go ahead go ahead no please I'm sorry no and then I was going to say in terms of your other question in terms of what we do in staff supporting staff. Um, again, I totally agree that it starts with the adults, and we felt that that was really needed. We've done lots of different things um, during COVID. We had a um, we we did it, we everyone had their cards and like you know like when you go to football games and people like you know bring food and have like a little like party. So we had like that. We everyone opened their cards and we had like food. We um, we've had things like gardening. We all made um, different kinds of herbs. Uh, we did uh, things like uh, we, we had them around Valentine's Day. We helped, we had all different supplies and people made scrubs. Sometimes we felt we just needed to do things together. And sometimes we felt we needed to talk. I felt like sometimes it was just people were too raw and they just didn't even want to talk. They just wanted to gather and just be. So it was a kind of a combination of, of, of those different types of activities that brought the staff together. So powerful. I mean, and that's it. Sometimes you just got to connect, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have to always talk about it all the time. Right. Sometimes we just need to have fun. It's right. why I had tracksuit Tuesdays. We got tra custom tracksuits made. Every All the teachers wore tracksuits. I wore a tracksuit. Mine had coach on it. It's sometimes just having fun together, right, is right. important. So I, I can't see who, who put this on because the, their name's not on there, but I think they, they have a great question, right? And it is teachers are also experiencing trauma too. That is a fact right? Mm -hmm. So how are teachers able to contribute meaningfully? That's up to the administrator to create that culture. And I, I'm, I have my ideas, but I want to hear what your ideas are, and then I'll share mine. So say that question again. So the question is? The question is, teachers are also experiencing trauma too. So how are teachers able to contribute meaningfully? Because that's up to the administration to create that culture. So I do think that 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 does happen. I, do, I definitely think that teachers are, and as I said, right from the onset, what I'm noticing this year is that I'm seeing teachers really being burnt out. And again, in terms of the literature, when people are burnt out, that's an organizational issue. So I do feel very strongly with that question that if we're seeing teachers being burnt out and traumatized, I, I don't want to put another burden on teachers and give another suggestion. I really do feel that we do need to look at the organization and I f and that we need to figure out structurally how things can be really different. That's my, you know, the, my primary. There probably are things teachers can individually do. I feel like focusing on what you can control and, and giving up the things that you can control can be also really helpful. Um, and I, like the other thing I sometimes shy away from is all the self-care stuff. I feel like it's, it, it's a very nice notion, but sometimes it feels just like another burden on people to like ask them to do this self-care. So uh, again, for me, I do feel like I really think it's very important for us to look at the organization and, and what's going on that, that that's happening and figure out how do we make some structural changes. I have a, this t-shirt on for a reason. It's unapologetic disruptor, right? And I have a hashtag that says disruptors unite. I have a really radical idea is that we just don't take it anymore. Um, at the end of the day, I agree so much of what was said. And I also agree to say it's not just the administrator's role to create the culture in the school. It's one person usually. It takes a team. It takes everybody having each other's back. And what you said, uh, what you said about the, the self-care, I am so tired of hearing self-care. Mm -hmm. No, we can't self-care our way out of the situation we're in. We have to collectively care and collectively unite 
around what this is, because at the end of the day, our kids are the ones that are suffering. Right. Right. The adults are suffering. Therefore, the kids are suffering. There's a, uh, there was a study done in 2016 that tested the cortisol levels of students in the classroom by their saliva and then had teachers self-report stress levels. And there was a direct correlation between overly stressed teachers and the increased cortisol levels in the kids in their classroom. We know this. So I think it's no one person's job to right. fix it. Right. And here's the other thing. Nobody's going to come and save us. Like the politicians aren't coming. The, the, the legislatures aren't coming. Our local school boards aren't coming. They don't know because they've never been in it. Right. And mm -hmm. I give a lot of empathy and grace in that space because you don't know if you don't know. But I also say it's not OK. Right. And in the words of Angela Davis, she said, I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things I cannot accept. Mm -hmm. And so there's a time and a space that we have to no longer accept it. But going to what you said, I think is so powerful. Focus on what is in our circle of control. Right. That is it. Now, that doesn't mean that we just have to stay quiet. Right. And, and not and just go along with it. That's not what I mean. But right now, trust me, if I could redo the whole educational system, if I could do that, I would do it right now. Right. I would wipe the whole thing. I would scrap <laughs> it and I would start over because it hasn't changed in mm, hundreds of years. Right. So we, we can't jump to that extreme. We have to go, OK, what can we do? And I say that from experience, because if people told me, like, you can't do these things when I started being a principal, not only did we do these things, we did them well. We had great impact. Our data showed it. And we actually had a ripple impact on education nationally and internationally. And so you can. It just looks like in incremental changes over time and focusing what is in your circle of control. Right. So powerful. And I feel it, you all. Right now, it's tough. It's tough on everybody. But here's what I, I hope never happens is we get into an us versus them with our students. Mm -hmm. Because I can feel that happening. I can feel the, the, the culture shift of adults versus kids. When we hit that space, it is a, it is a hard return. If you feel like you're against the kids in your classroom or you're against the kids in your school, yeah. that's a hard return. That's a time to go, okay, I need to push the pause button. I've either got to step out or I got to take some leave. I've got to do something because it's a, it's a hard point of almost no return if you let it go too deeply. Right. And again, I, you know, in terms of Ross Green's work, I really am a big believer that kids do well when they can. And I think that we as educators or people in schools or working with kids, we have to keep that mindset. Um, it doesn't, you know, nothing good comes from having an idea that kids do, you know, kids are doing this to push people's buttons or being manipulated, all those types of things. It's really, it, it, it's a no go from there. Fact. And Ross Green was on this podcast and he talked about all of that and i agree and and i do think too that a lot of adults do well if they can yes um i do believe that and it's not easy as an administrator when teachers are having a hard time it's not easy as an administrator when i'm having a hard time but when i was having a hard time do you know what i told my staff i'm having a hard time <laughs> i'm having a hard time i'm just gonna be honest like I, right now i was a very um I was a very vulnerable uh, leader um, because there were times and teachers would come to me and say, I'm not, I'm not doing okay right now. Guess what? We're going to get some support in there. We've got your back. I'll come in. Um, but it became harder and harder and harder as this pandemic change had continued to have an impact. So, so I, I ask one question that I love to give a lot of time to, and I, I want, you can have a pause and think about it, but what do you want educators to know from one educator to another, and by that, not me to you, but you to all of the people listening, what do you want them to know right now from you? I think that a lot of your listeners know this, but I really see these skill as skills. I feel like building resilience, building grit, building um, social, emotional well-being, social skills. These are all things that we can teach kids. And I do think that, again, having that trauma-informed lens, we can't teach them when they're in the moment. But when kids are regulated and in the right spot, these are skills that we can teach them and that they um, have, like, again, that privilege to be able to do that. And I do think that schools are moving in that direction, even though there is some backlash, like you mentioned before, um, about us, us doing that. But I think having that idea that 
when kids are in a place and they're, you know, not during a crisis, that these are things that we can teach them. We can teach them about their feelings. We can teach them about their brain. We can teach them about having a growth mindset. We can teach them about the behaviors, being flexible and what that looks like. And if it's not working, there's nothing wrong with that child. It just means that they haven't learned that skill yet and that we need to kind of come back to the drawing board and see that as what I call a fail. That's just our first attempt in learning. And how do we reconfigure this for our children and for ourselves without blame, without judgment? So um, that's something I would really like our educators that are listening um, to think about. That's usually the last question I ask, but I I got one more. I don't know who the, I don't know who the listeners, but they've got great questions. Um, And I think this is a really powerful one and I have a lot of opinions on it, but I'm not going to share all of them. I'm going to let you share yours and then I'll share a few because we are almost out of time. But uh, the listener says student voice is a big topic trending in education. And I 100% student voice, 100% support it. I'll just be very honest. Parent rights as well. Teachers are losing power yet. We are the most trained. When will the profession get res- get back respect and when when we demand it? What do you recommend? Hmm. So I think that's an interesting question. Very. I think that a lot of the things that I think about are dialectical, meaning they're often an end. It's mm-hmm. not a one or the other. I think that there's value in students having voice. I think there's value in teachers having respect. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I don't think it has to be one or the other. I think yeah. I understand why people think about that. It goes back to what I said about this gestalt that we're living in, this polarized world that we're all sort of like drinking the Kool-Aid. However, I think we need to stop and say it doesn't have to be that way. We need to help people to understand that we can hold these two opposing things and it's, and it's okay. Um, You know, I have another student that's sort of struggling Mm -hmm. and was having a lot of problems with respect. And at the same time, um, you know, I understand that he was struggling. And one of the things that I said over and over again is that I know you're really having a hard time and you have to talk to your teacher respectfully. It doesn't have to be one or the other. I I mean, you you took the words out of my mouth. (laughs) I think there was one there was one word in there that stuck out to me. And, and listener, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are because I can't see your name, but it was the word power. We're losing power. See, I think that's where the crux of the work happens is it's it's about power and control. We have to move away from this idea of losing power and control because that's what the system has been developed for centuries. For, for, for hundreds of years, it's been about kids come to school. They do what they're told. They're supposed to do what they're told. It's about I'm in power. You are not. There's, we've got to start having a shift because kids now have access to more information than they ever have. They have, they have access to having a voice that they've never had before, whether it's through, and I'm not part of it, and a TikTok or whatever, Instagram, they, they have voice. And we've got to be able to figure out how do we create schools and cultures where that can be valued, but like you said, both and, and they can do it in a way that is that is respectful, that is heard. Um, We've got to figure this conundrum out because the face of education is at a crossroads right now. To me, we've got to figure out the crossroad because what we've always done is not going to continue to work. And so we have to figure out what is going to work. Um, And I also will say too, something that you said is really powerful about, you know, if you do this, but you still have to respect your teacher. And I used to have the same conversation too. I understand that, but you still have to respect the student. Mm -hmm. I understand your, I know that happened yesterday and you're still really bothered by it. So let's do, let's do a circle. Let's get in. You can express that to the student. Hey, I'm really still really frustrated and and I'm going to get to the point where I'm okay. But right now I'm still not okay. We have to do this both ways, right? Because we are human, all of us, every single one of us. And sometimes we carry things that we need not to carry in the hopes of healing and hope right? We've got to go through these processes. Thank you so much for all of this dialogue. We kind of went all over the place and I loved it. Whoever this listener is, I love that you're so engaged in these great conversations. And I hope you come back um, every week because it's really (laughs) helped this conversation get deeper. But if they want to follow your work, where are they going to find you on social media? How can they get your book? All of that good stuff. 
So I have a website um, and you can find everything on my website. It's my name. It's drbaruchfeldman.com. Also, um, I'm on Facebook. It's under my name. It's Karen Baruch Feldman. Also, um, I am Dr. Grit Girl on uh, Instagram. And I do have also my name. It's Karen Feldman on Twitter. Um, they can also, if people have questions, I really like to keep having this conversation. They can email me. They email me um, from the website. And if they're interested in the books, they're really available where all books are sold. Um, if they go to my website, they'll see it. But obviously, in you know, things like Amazon's Barnes and Noble and all those things and from the publisher. So um, and, and again, my hope in coming here is that, again, I do feel like these are skills that can be taught. And I just would love to get the message out. I do think that even though grit has a, a bad uh, a little thing, I do think it during these times, it can be really valuable. And I definitely think that resilience is something that we really need to lean into and help our, our youngsters learn those skills while at the same time, and really looking at the organization and the culture and, and, and seeing what we can do as more as a community. Absolutely. And 100%. And I think how we teach kids resilience is to show up for them every day that we can. And if we can't be honest with them that you're having a hard time right. uh, because that's how we teach each other. If you want to follow me, you can follow me on uh, Instagram and Twitter at principal list. If you want to follow me on uh, Facebook, you can follow me at Matthew Portel, my personal page or uh, my not personal page. It's probably more exciting than my personal unless you want to see like pictures of my kid playing soccer and me fishing. And then LinkedIn, um, it's Matthew Portel at, as well. Please follow the podcast at the Trauma Informed Educators Network podcast. Um, give a, give me a review. Tell me what you think. Even if it's terrible, it's okay. I, I can handle it. I'm, I'm used to it. But please tell me what you think um, because it's it's how I continue to guide and drive this work. And I love doing this podcast, but I also love hearing feedback. If you're not part of the Trauma Informed Educators Network group on Facebook, please join that. Right now, it's we just hit 29,600 people from over 100 different countries that go there to talk, dialogue, ask questions, share resources, all kinds of uh, things happen there, including the conference that we literally just did last week called the Trauma Informed Educators Network Conference here in Nashville, uh, where there were 200 and plus people uh, coming together and connect. So thank you all so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Burak Feldman. I appreciate your thoughts. I think I will be back next week. I honestly <laughs> don't know. I'll have to look at the schedule. But nonetheless, I uh, really appreciate Oh, and one more thing. Uh, I do. We we printed these shirts called Un they have unapologetic disruptor. If you're watching, you can see it. If you're listening, you can't. Um, they were so popular that I had another run made. And so you can go to the Trauma Informed Educators Network Facebook page or group. And I am ordering more. And I'm going to just ship them out to everyone. Uh, I just did it as like a, hey, I think this would be kind of cool. And didn't realize there were a lot of people who thought it was cool too. Uh, so if you want one of these shirts, go to those pages and you can fill out the Google form. And I will even send you a little invoice from PayPal for it. <laughs> so thank you guys so much. And as always, please, please, please just continue to wash your hands. <laughs> All right. We are still live here. If you are here live, thank you. Whoever the listener was, I don't see your name. I'm going to look when we get off because I'll be able to see it on yeah. the social media platforms. Thank you for those amazing questions. Thank you for your engagement. It, it had me thinking. You had me thinking. And I love thinking and reflecting. So thank you all. And I most likely will see you next week.